Hi everyone. Hi. I'm Jennifer Podemski. This I'm Sarah Podemski. <laughs> might be my sister. Um, I live in Barrie and uh, this is my um, Barrie Film Festival intimate conversation about my career as a filmmaker in Canada. Why right don't on. you introduce yourself? I'm Jennifer's sister. I'm also an actor and producer. And we just thought it would be fun if uh, I asked Jen some questions. And uh, she's going to give us her incredible story and lead us on a very hopeful path forward. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit of responsibility. I want to make more. How about that? Great. That's nice. That's better. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so who inspired you to get into storytelling on the screen? Oh my god. Uh, okay, so, um, I think the first, the first thing was performing, was like theater performing. And that was our grandmother who would take us to shows, me, me for sure, because I was the only grandchild. So she would take me to shows as early as grade three, um, you know, plays in Toronto and musicals. And she had a friend who had a daughter who was an actress and, so that kind of was like, oh my God, that's a thing. People do that. People get on stage and sing and dance and that's crazy. Um, so that definitely sparked my interest in performing. Um, she continued to take uh, me to the Nutcracker Suite um, where I became very interested in dance. And it's not, it's not hard to notice when, when you see someone who's a, a performer like as a child and I think I was just one of those kids mm -hmm. like I was just a singing dancing kind of like acty type of dramatic person and so that was sort of my my first I guess the first sort of light bulb was that phase grade three grade four when I really started to take an interest in performing um, but then it was not till later, like in grade six, after I had really done extensive performing already in theater, um, that my dad, our dad, <laughs> um, he has a friend, he had a friend who was a producer at CBC. He was on a show called, um, uh, Wonderstruck, mm -hmm, something like that. Wonderstruck. Um, and also he produced a show called Take 30. So he brought me, I used to go hang with him on weekends. Like he used to babysit me on weekends. Um, you know, the parents would take me or he would pick me up and some days he would take me to work and his work was CBC, like way back when it was on Jarvis or whatever. And I would go and sit on set of Take 30 and I would just like watch fascinated of the whole like thing and how it worked and all of that. So, uh, yeah, and then one thing led to the next, and by, I think, grade seven, um, I was, uh, I auditioned for one of his episodes of Wonderstruck, and I shot the episode about the Zamboni, and we shot it in Nathan Phillips Square, and I remember being terrible at it and really scared, but it definitely was another light bulb. Was it drama, or was it like a, like a little It was like a, it was it's like a science show. Oh, so you got yeah. to be yourself, you kind of yeah, you're like... totally yourself which is so much harder than acting totally it was so much harder like I had already done theater community theater and I had sang and dance and did stuff in front of people but then there was this the like Bob McDonald the host of the show was like asking me questions and I had a script and I was just like uh <laughs> I couldn't answer anything I couldn't remember the script like it was it was terrible but it was cool it was a cool experience and it was pretty fascinating for me so I would say that, you know, there were, it was, it was those things and I know there were others and I just remembered one the other day and now I forget it, but there was another something that happened in and around that time mm -hmm. um, when I was just like, and fame, the show fame mm -hmm. had a, like was huge. I was like, I want to, I want to go to a school like that. I want to be a, I want to be a dancer. I want to be a performer. How I ended up being being in this position, you know, today as a producer, writer, director, actor, is was for the love of performing. 
And then you went to Earl Haig, which is a performing arts school. Yes. So I did end up auditioning for the high school of performing arts, um, which was at Earl Haig Secondary School in Toronto and, uh, or North York. And I became a dance major. Um, and then my whole life was about dancing. Like that's all it was, you know, you went, you went there. <laughs> it's just all, you know, the whole, it was fame. Yeah. It was like all like so competitive and dancing. I would dance in school and after school and on the weekends and shows and recitals and rehearsals. And, you know, when you're a performer, as you know, because I think you've been a performer longer, you were a performer earlier than I was and like really was like full into it. You were doing lots of other things that I never did. Um, but it's, it's definitely a way of life. Like once you're, it's a commitment. It's a huge commitment. So, you can't dabble in it. No, you can't just be like I. I dabble in, in performing arts. It's like no. It's if you're if you're in the performing arts, then it's just a given that you like work your ass off. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is you're doing, dancing, singing, auditioning, recitals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you think that? I think because there's that change, I guess, in adolescence, if you are in the performing arts, that there's actually an opportunity that arises to make it a professional career. Where do you think that was when the, the like actual, like as a teenager, cause you had had the experiences before and you had kind of fallen in love with that um, set and that whole culture as a teenager, when, when did those opportunities start happening for you that it became real because it became real for you very mm -hmm. at a really young age yeah um I think it really became real you know because I was a bigger girl like I, and when I look back I was not a big girl but like I was Hollywood big Sanders, for yeah. for dance mm -hmm. for ballet I was big for you know Hollywood mm -hmm. I was big I was bigger and taller mm -hmm. and like more big boned so I think I always got the message from people that I just wouldn't really make it as a dancer and I really wouldn't, wasn't really made for TV. Um, but I did love the theater. So I kind of really excelled in theater in, at, at, in high school and somehow, I don't even know how, but I got in line or maybe my theater, my drama teacher sent me to, uh, to line up to get our pictures taken by a casting director. I feel like I remember this. Who was... Uh, I wish I had that picture. Show no, 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 show. no. It was a Polaroid. Not a, oh, not oh, a like headshot. A casting session. Yeah, like okay. a casting session. It was a Polaroid. They were just taking, like, pictures and that was it. To be, hit? Yeah, I, yeah. To be an extra yeah. in a movie. I think it was oh. a movie or a TV series. I forget which one came first. Anyway, I ended up getting the call. Yeah. I know what it was. It was a TV series and it was called 9B and it was for CBC. 9B. And, uh, so I would go because our school, the reason why they came to our school is because a lot of like all the Degrassi kids went to our school. It was a school of performing arts. Mm -hmm. So everyone who was, had a career in performing arts, not everyone, but a lot of people, yeah. like you would go to our school and there was just people you saw on TV all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. So casting directors knew that if they came there, that's the, the school would understand and work around your schedule. So I ended up getting cast as a, like a regular extra for the classroom on 9B. <laughs> and it's, it's really a remarkable story because, you know, when you think about your, your path and, uh, and you're very uh, aware of the, like kind of the signs along the way, it's so interesting because on that show was Michelle St. John. Oh, who no way. way back in like grade seven around grade seven ish, I cut out her picture from the newspaper because she starred in a movie called where the spirit lives, which mm -hmm. was a school about a movie about residential school. And I had never seen anything about indigenous people like that. And it, it was so, it had such a major impact on mm -hmm. my existence on everything. And I just idolized her. And if you remember at the time, our sister Tamara was in a choir Oh yeah. And that choir ended up singing with on a on a big show with Coretta Scott King and then Wayne St. John was the was the leader of the choir. Yeah. Anyways, for whatever reason, 
I ended up either going to pick her up or being with daddy when he picked her up. And, and Mich- that choir director was Michelle St. John's dad. Yeah. Was she in the choir? Who's a, yeah, she yeah, was in the choir. And like, I had just seen her on TV. I cut out her newspaper and she was like the most famous native person that I knew. Anyways, she was on 9B and this is years later. And I was just literally in awe, in awe of her. I would, it was shot in a studio in Toronto. I would walk by her like dressing room, just be like, just staring at her name on the door and being like, I want to be like her. I want to be that person that made that, that me, that young kid feel that way. Like that she's, she exists because that it really did have an impact on me. Um, so I did that background stuff and I loved it. I loved it. I was like, you know, I watch my son now who's, who's eight. Um, he was on N with an E and he, you know, he kind of got the role out of an audition by accident and like, anyway, he got picked. But when I saw him on set, I was like, he, he's got it. He knows. Yeah. He loves it. This is going to be something he's going to do. Yeah. And that's, you just know. And I really knew when I was sitting there as an extra in the classroom, I didn't care if we were doing it 40 times. Like mm-hmm. I didn't care if we were doing it from a hundred angles. Like it was just so exhilarating. So, um, and then I really, I, I really dug, like I dug the, the extra background work thing. And then I, I don't even know how the second one came about, but I think it was either the same cast direct, director or another casting director, uh, came to the school I don't really remember the details, but mm-hmm. I ended up in a movie called Prom Night 3. Yes. I and I would that. go and shoot it on, on the weekends. And it was, you know, it was pretty evident. It was a horror movie. It was a horror movie. Mm-hmm. On that movie, that I really needed to know what it was like to be that guy behind the monitor. Mm-hmm. And I would listen And by the time I finished shooting that movie, I think I did it for like four weekends in a row because it was, it's a prom, right? So I was a prom, I was at the prom. So it was a big, it was a big role and they even got a close up. Like if you watch the movie, you'll see that I have a close up (laughs) in it. Um, And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of just knew from that point on that I was definitely not going to be a dancer. And that I was going to be an actor and that acting was just, I was meant for it. Mm -hmm. And so that must have been in grade 11, 10 or 11, somewhere around there. And, uh, because shortly after that, I got an agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crazy. And then your life took other avenues but it brought you back to should we talk about dancing outside which is kind of like the breakout oh my god yeah like life-changing experience that you had yeah I mean the I've never really what's been weird about me is that I've never really like worked consistently Mm -hmm. but somehow the work that I did do, even if I was doing like one movie a year as an actor Mm -hmm. and a couple shows, it was a lot for like a young native girl. Like nobody else was working like that at the time. Um, There were so few of us. So even the first job that I got um, was the day that I got the agent. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go to CBC and they were like asking me about, I didn't know anything. Like, how old are you? And I was like, oh, I'm 17. And they were like, oh, and then they called the agent. She's like, why would you tell them your age? You're not supposed to tell them your age. And I was like, I don't know. Like, they were asking me all these questions. <laughs> and she's like, well, now you just lost the role that they were going to give you because it was older for an older character or whatever. And, you know, if you were a little bit older, you could have got it. But they're going to give you another role anyways. And I was like, amazing. Cool. I got a role. <laughs> like, I got a real role. So that was on Conspiracy yeah. of Silence, which also starred Michelle St. John. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never got to meet her on that. I still no to, that, to that day had never actually met her. I just idolized her. Um, it was Michelle St. John. And uh, she uh, she starred in the movie. 
um, about Helen Betty Osborne. And that was like, I got to fly up to North Bay mm -hmm. and it was like a huge deal for me. Yeah. I didn't have any lines. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, called silent on camera, whatever. Um, but you know, the director talks to you. You're not an extra anymore. And the director's allowed to talk to you. And I got real direction and I worked, you know, like five days in the courtroom and it was a, a huge job for me and I made a lot of money. It was crazy. Um, and then the next one, and then I just started booking a bunch of shows, mm -hmm. small shows. Um, and then came the, the seven auditions that I did for the diviners. Oh, the diviners. Yeah. Yes, and that yes, was, yes. I was still in high school at the time planning to like, I was finishing high school early. Mm -hmm. So I was in grade 12 doing all my grade 13 classes mm -hmm. at night school. And I would go down to like Eastern Avenue. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even believe that I would do that at, at that age. Yeah. I was, was, I was 17. I was 18. Still, it was a gross area at yeah. the time. And I would go at night, go and mm -hmm. do these auditions, spill my heart out. And, uh, do do audition for the lead the, the supporting lead of this movie called the diviners and uh and then i didn't get it they gave it to michelle st john so i went to israel mm -hmm. i was like after this i'm done with this business man <laughs> i'm so done i'm like so tired of this playing with my emotions it's so hard and like, I'm always auditioning for native stuff. Like there, no one's ever even going to see me for like a, a regular person role. Mm -hmm. It's always like these, you know, and, and Michelle's always going to get them um, or whoever. There wasn't really many of us. And then like six months later, I was in Israel uh, working on a kibbutz. And like, I think at the time that I got the call, I was like cleaning the kitchen floor of the cafeteria and the someone said your your agent's on the phone I was like my agent <laughs> so I went to the to the phone and she's like you have to fly to Winnipeg in two days you got the lead the role in the diviners <laughs> I ended up flying on my 19th birthday I remember it was May 3rd I flew to Winnipeg uh from Israel uh to start to not star but it was you know a significant role yeah. So that was really like the first significant role. And then the second one was uh, Dancing Outside, which was sort of a mistake because Bruce McDonald actually took Tamara, our sister, for lunch because oh. they had been talking about another project. And then, and she was so young and I was like, ew, that's gross. That that person, that guy's asking you to go for lunch for a meeting. Like, who does that? And you're so young. So... <laughs> I went and I sat at a different table. He was no. like, no, come here for a second. I was like, <laughs> did you do the diviners? I was like, yes. He's like, do you think you would want to be considered for this role? And tomorrow I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah, uh, I got the, the lead female of that film. And then, yeah, everything sort of really... I would say snowballed, but mm -hmm. if it was like another, like my peers who were, let's say non-Indigenous or yeah. white, uh, really, you know, when that happened, those kinds of things happen to you and you're n not, you know, a person, an Indigenous or black, or, yeah, really yeah, tight cast. um, then it's a lot, you're just a lot more, um, a lot less employed, mm -hmm. a less frequently employed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, I did Dance Me Outside, and then I did uh, uh, maybe something else, something small, and then I did some theater, and then I did The Res, which mm -hmm. was, you know, based on spin off the... from Dance Me Outside. But it was a good time, like, the 90s was, it seemed like there was a lot of Indigenous content. Yeah. Yeah, there was. And I think that was, you know, pretty, pretty formative in terms of, um, or, f like, fundamental in terms of Form, forming my my or fueling my desire to do something that was really more authentic mm -hmm. in terms of the lens because pretty much throughout the 90s and it literally was that whole 10-year period mm -hmm. right um it was it was a 10-year period where my my career was was exclusively as an actor you know, I did a couple, I did a couple things as a director and mm -hmm. I opened my own production company, like in, when I was like 20, mm -hmm. but nothing happened with those things. Um, and I never really, 
uh, took off as a as a director because I just kept working as an actor. Mm-hmm. But I did. I st- I started to get very resentful mm-hmm. um, about the work that was being done. Um, just about the the show, like the lack of um, indigenous, authentic indigenous stories. And almost all the work, all the work I did, except that one movie I did with Kent Monkman, who is, you know, a famous Mm -hmm. artist now, but at the time he was a writer director Mm -hmm. and he did a a short film. Actually, I just realized at the 20th anniversary of anniversary of the imaginative film festival, which is our indigenous film festival, that blood river, which Mm -hmm. was the movie I did with Kent Monkman was the first movie Wow. To, to screen at Imagine wow. So that was 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, the 90s was full of uh, me, uh, you know, building a career as an actor, but also in the interim, um, between jobs, like working at a regular job, mm-hmm. but also um, uh, traveling across Canada and the States and mm-hmm. sometimes Europe, um, training people, Mm -hmm. training indigenous youth behind the scenes and working with communities and doing theater workshops and really focusing on um, getting the information and the resources out there to the indigenous community about all the potential that exists in the film industry. Mm -hmm. Um, Because even though it was a big time, people were really, you know, I guess, oh, they were celebrating so indigenous culture. They thought there were still no indigenous yeah. people behind the, not like writing these shows no. or directing them no. or producing them. I mean, at the time there was North of 60 and yes, Jordan Wheeler mm-hmm. was a writer on that show. Yeah. Um, and, and yes, Alanisa Bonsoin was, was a celebrated mm-hmm. documentary. Uh, but you, there, there were no shows. There was no indigenous like lens. Indigenous kind of showrunners yeah. or like no, were yeah. at the making the decisions that were no at the highest level creatively or none of that. Yeah, none of that. I mean, still today, there's yeah, there's hardly any of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so so yeah, I would say that the '90s was definitely um, the. Uh, the phase that led me to realize that I just was not willing to participate in, you know, being in these, just being an actor who was going to be available for, you know, exclusively indigenous work. Mm-hmm. Um, which I wasn't only getting indigenous work. Like I was at a point in my career where I was able to like, be in a lot of different shows, uh, you know, including Riverdale and Degrassi and non-Indigenous characters. Like, mm-hmm. I played several non-specific characters. That is very unusual, mm-hmm. and I was just very lucky. But I was still very angry about the kind of racism that I would see on set. Um, you know, just people, just general intolerance and racism towards indigenous people and Mm -hmm. stories and mocking us and you know I just have a million stories about things that you know I experienced or other people experienced and I just was angry about it you know I remember I remember uh, going to Arizona I don't even remember when that was or I don't even know if it was like after I started my production company when I went to do look looking for Lost Bird, mm-hmm. and I remember being in my trailer and hearing kind of a fight outside, like people screaming. And I looked out and I was watching Irene Bedard, who's you know one of our celebrated actresses from the states, uh, who was the star of that movie with Mercedes Rule. So mm-hmm. Mercedes Rule was the star star, and then it was Irene Bedard, and I played Irene's sister, and she was yelling. She was. Show, like having a showdown with the costume designer mm-hmm. about her Navajo wardrobe. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I just like have such a clear memory of looking through the blinds on my, uh, of my trailer, you know, how the trailers are lined up mm-hmm. when you're on set and they were standing and fighting right in the, between the trailers. 
And I just watched the whole thing. I, I watched this little Irene Bedard like stand up to this, to this woman and just the way she tried to educate her and school her on, you know, not doing her homework and trying to dress Irene up like she like lived in the 1400s and this yeah. is a modern day story. And she was like, I'm not wearing this. You're, you're, you didn't do your homework. You're not doing this properly. And you're not just going to ruin this experience, but you're going to embarrass, embarrass all of us. Yeah. So I had just seen a lot of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need a reminder like that to kind of push you a little further to maybe making bolder decisions about how, I guess it did push me further to thinking about how I might, how I might really change mm -hmm. this. So this doesn't, these kinds of things don't happen. Um, another really, a really crazy moment was when I did a, a movie for uh, Nickelodeon, I think it was, and it was offered to me, it was given to me. And at the time, you know, I was just like, the director said, you know, I, I really just want you to do this and it's going to be terrible. Like it'll be, it's, it's so racist. It's so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know that if I give you the job, like that they will say yes, but otherwise you're going to hire a white person to play this right. role and, you know, paint her up. So I did the role and it was like, almost every day when we were working with big groups of indigenous people as extras, I would like watch the crew mock them mm -hmm. and like do the, oh, like stuff like that. So like all of those things, you know, over 10 years led me to a time in my life where I, well, I moved to New York mm -hmm. <laughs> to Mar with Tamara, our sister who was living in New York at the time. And I just like lived at her house at her apartment. No, I like lived with her and her husband <laughs> in a one bedroom apartment and slept on the couch while I worked at a gym <laughs> for nine months and uh, contemplated my existence and, you know, tried to do some acting, but then ultimately realized and like kind of gave birth to the idea that I had to like leave the industry as an actor and become a producer, mm -hmm. even though I had no idea really what that meant, yeah. what the producer thing was all about. I just knew that I, I needed to be in charge so that people stopped making inappropriate, inauthentic, racist, stereotypical movies. And so that, you know, networks and funders and the system uh, in general would stop supporting those narratives because, you know, someone else or we were starting to speak up for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a perfect storm. It really was. Like once I put that out into the universe, um, everything kind of like came together. It really was, it was the universe kind of just bringing all kinds of little pieces together. So I think I was like 25. I was turning 25. I had just hosted the National Aboriginal Achievement Awards, which was a, a live event in, it was in Regina, maybe, I traveled around, where I met, so that was in January of that year of 1999, and I met Laura Milliken, who was an associate producer on that show. We kind of hung out a couple times, and we talked a bit about different things, like kind of related to each other about growing up in Toronto, and you know, being in the, in the industry because she was in journalism at the time and she was like kind of feeling the same way I was, like angry at the representation and lack of it and all that stuff. So we had a couple passionate call, uh, conversations like that um, while at the same time I was offered a TV series in Toronto. So it kind of took me from New York back to Toronto. On that TV series, I got close with my, my co-actor co on the show who had her own show Mm. called nightlife or something it was melissa demarco yeah melissa demarco and i was just like you like you make your own show like what how do you do that she's like oh yeah no, i do this and then i write direct produce and i do everything and this is how i do it and she like basically like showed me how to make a show like a talk like a yeah. uh like a lifestyle show yeah and i was like 
I'm going to make a lifestyle show. And then at the same time, like Laura got back in touch with me. And then I got a call from this, this guy who I knew from somewhere. I don't even know where I knew him from. Oh, he was a musician and I had known him and I bumped into him and he was like, Oh, Hey, I'm just at this board meeting for APTN. It's a, a brand new television network, Aboriginal television network. Uh, this was like a college in Bathurst or call it, it was like a random bumping into someone. And I was like, what? Like a television network? <laughs> we have a television Because network? I had already been like kind of talking to Laura about that. We're going to make a show together. Yeah. And that we want to do a show that profiles like that we host together. And I pre predominantly host because I had some celebrity at the time that we profile like incredible indigenous youth mm -hmm. and that show was called the seventh generation. And then we started like mommy started helping me put some ideas together where we could raise money and start to go mm -hmm. to communities and to government and to whatever. So we started putting the show together and honestly, like I called every network and nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm. Like I heard things like, Oh, we had an Aboriginal on our, on our, on our, awards show last year so we've kind of done our aboriginal thing already and i've heard like uh you know we There's don't not enough aboriginals aboriginals yeah. they were calling us uh by cars so that was in in reference to the commercial time right yeah so I, I heard it all, and by that time I was like, we're never going to make this show. Like, there's no way we're going to find the money to make the show unless we just do it ourselves and, uh, you know, and then take it to networks. Anyway, it was – so when I bumped into him and he was like, yeah, there's a, an Aboriginal television network that is launching. M you know, do you mind if I give your number to someone? So then I got a call saying, you know, will you be an ambassador for the show? It would it require you to, like, go here and there and – you know, represent, or not the show, the network, uh, travel around and kind of represent the network and maybe, you know, support us in our CRTC hearings. And I was like, y yes, but can you do me a favor? <laughs> can you put my show on your network? Cause I have a show. We just don't know, you know, how to make it, how to, how to raise the money. Anyway, it was really, it was really the first, it was my first, uh, experience as a, as a bonafide producer, because mm -hmm. Laura and I devised like a very complex plan on how to raise money because APTN gave us a license, but the license was like $600 an episode wow. at the time. And it, we knew that it was going to cost us, <laughs> and I can't even believe I'm saying this, like $5,000 an episode <laughs> to do. So we, I like called Together, we managed to get every flight, every hotel, everything paid for mm -hmm. in kind. And we would, at the time, it was one of those, it was that time of the industry where you could put, you know, a, a little commercial or a, or a, a logo mm -hmm. on your show and people would consider that advertising. Yeah. So we ended up doing you know, three seasons of the show like that. That's crazy. And then we built Big Soul Productions. We built our first production company and ended up becoming a really a full service co company for, you know, concept to completion, post production to post production to delivery and distribution, everything, mm -hmm. because there was nobody doing it. Mm -hmm. And also nobody wanted indigenous content. Yeah. So it, there was nowhere else for it to live. Mm -hmm. Um, we did get it into the school systems and you know so that was uh 20 years ago yeah or so and then you know then and, <laughs> and then there's the next and then, and then and there's the next 20 years let's see but, yeah. then. oh my god uh, this is so long how long is it oh, it's like 25 minutes okay um do 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 okay um I mean, you really answered lots of lots of these in this, in this <laughs> incredible storytelling. Um, okay, number one, I'm trying to. Which where do you? Okay. What do you see happening right now in the industry, and 
what are your dreams for the future for indigenous storytelling, indigenous filmmakers, um, just it, in every aspect of the industry, what is your vision of what, it, where we could potentially be in the next few years? Like if, you know, there's a lot of awareness right now, I think there is a yearning for, you know, true indigenous narratives and true representation. I think people are understanding now that, you know, there's a lot of the story they haven't been told. So with people's eyes opening and then willing to, to watch more and, and support more, if that continues, where do you think we can, we can end up in the next few years? Well, I think that um, there's a, a long way to go in terms of, uh, you know, finding uh, or creating a better relationship with Indigenous stories. You know, like, it's, it's a process and we're still at a, at a, at a time where uh, the networks um, and, and, you know, platforms that exist really are quite void of those stories. Um, so I guess I personally think that it's really about, um, there's two, there's two things. One is to continue kind of evolving the way we are over here, but also really um, mobilizing to create our own platforms. Um, and, you know, own them in a way, like have autonomy over those platforms mm -hmm. so that you're not, and that's, that's really, you know, how it, how it works for everybody is, is when you work with a network, unless you're like at a very, very high level, you know, you have very little say about how, how a show is, um, you know, ultimately, ultimately presented. It's not that you have little say, like obviously it's being taken on um, because it's being greenlit because the, the network is behind it and is the champion of the story and, you know, believes in it. But ultimately, you know, they are, they're concerned about their image mm. and their bottom line. Um, similar to distributors with feature films, you know, like feature films are, are another really difficult um, thing to sell, right? Not everyone gets to, to make a feature film and then gets to, to make money off of it. Mm. That's not like really how it goes for most of us. Um, so yeah, I think the future is just, you know, really being able to create a more inclusive, um, industry that is reflective of the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still, I can, I can safely say that we're not anywhere close to, you know, that, that moment that I watched Michelle St. John on Where the Spirit Lives and the, the way that I felt mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I existed and I was so proud of that. We're not in a place even today, like however many years later, you know almost 40 years later, mm. um, where, where that is the norm. Mm -hmm. It's still like a niche. It really is. It really is. It's, it's a I niche. I read a statistic that we're, we're less than 1% of the stories being told on film, in film and television. Yeah. In the media. Yeah, that's, and that's, you know, really, it's really sad. And I mean, it goes, it goes so much deeper than that. You know, like when people talk about diversity and, uh, you know, representation and things like that, we don't have another place mm -hmm. where, where it's different for us. This is it. Mm -hmm. Like, this is where we exist mm -hmm. in this country, in yeah. this place. Yeah. We don't have a, a secondary market. We can sell. You know, yeah, we don't come from somewhere else yeah, yeah. <laughs> that has a market. You yeah. know, so in the diversity conversation, we're 
people aren't even acknowledging yeah. that diversity is over here and indigenous is over here because indigenous is here. This is where it is. Mm -hmm. It's only here. Yeah. So I think people are still figuring it out. Um, you know, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't know. People are figuring it out. I think networks have to be way more accountable for, you know, the things that are, that are being greenlit and the people who are making those things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, uh, stories, indigenous stories, like I'm hopeful that the, the newly sort of created indigenous screen office will offer many more opportunities to, you know, offset some of the challenges for filmmakers mm -hmm. because that's, you know, I mean, empire of dirt that took me like eight, eight years to make. Right. And it was like a really, really long journey. And then, uh, you know, the distributor, if I would have known then that, you know, you're, you want a distributor so badly because the distributor kind of validates the existence of the movie, but even the numbers, like I didn't even realize the numbers involved in, you know, with a distributor and that they could get you into a the like we made no money at the theater there was no marketing there was no pre like promotion for the theatrical release at all yet it apparently cost a hundred thousand dollars that i'm still paying off because mm -hmm. every sale on air canada or whatever i still owe money on that movie it's interesting um for filmmakers and people kind of coming into their own as storytellers and, you know, choosing to, to step into this industry. You're talking about all these different steps that we, as, uh, that as outsiders, we, or when we're learning, we think these are like milestones, like to get a distributor for your film or, you know, to get a project green light or to get a script scene or to get an agent or like all these things that we're like, this is it. Now I'm part of ACTRA. Now I'm part of the union. Now I'm this. And there's like, all of these stepping stones, we kind of tell ourselves like, this is, this is the next step. This is the next step. But as you're saying, like behind every curtain, there's a whole other set of challenges yeah. for filmmakers. And we need to talk about the inner workings because it's hard already for filmmakers. And then for filmmakers of color, indigenous filmmakers, yeah. um, who, who may not have as many resources yeah. and may not have the same people championing them. Yeah it's a really hard reality. Were there people that were mentors to you that helped you understand the insanity of um, the, the process at all? Were there any people you would, would say, um, you know, helped guide you while you were trying to figure out? I've had a lot of great mentors, like lots of great mentors. Um, Brian Dennis, who produced Dance Me Outside and later on The Res. Um, I, I had stayed in touch with him over time and he was instrumental in helping me build uh, my first show, my first series. Um, there was Linda Schuyler from, she, she owns Epitome Pictures that mm -hmm. did Degrassi and Riverdale and lots of other shows. Um, but when I was on, it was probably Degrassi cause I did Degrassi for 10 years. So it was like later on when I'm, when I probably was working on my first drama series that I was also on Degrassi and would take meetings with her. She would mm -hmm. look at our budgets oh, wow. and like help us figure out how, how that all happened. Also, um, Laura and I went, went, I went many years, but me and Laura went to the Summer Institute of Film and Television. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, it was a remarkable opportunity. It was like a one week event in Ottawa. And it had like so many different courses you could take. And, and it was just amazing. So we took one at the time when we were trying to shop Moccasin Flats. Um, we knew I think we knew, I don't even remember actually when we went, but, but we knew that we were, we were going to build this show or 
you know, I would have to ask her the, mm. the dates. But anyways, Mike Volpe was our instructor. And he, at the time, was the producer of Trailer Park Boys. And he basically, because our show that we were going to make was sim a similar size to, mm -hmm. to Trailer Park Boys, um, yeah, he, he really showed us the ropes. Wow. Big time. And then, you know, there were tons of other people, mm -hmm. like tons of other people along the way. Like the, a lot of the time, you know, it's about knowing when to ask for help mm -hmm. and not to over ask. Right. And, you know, when to, when to, um, use that, that, that very Resource. limited, those very limited favors, you yeah. know, or, you know, relationships. Um, I think it's, those relationships are very important, but it's also really important not to, um, over, over ask, I yeah. guess is the best way, you know, and, and know the timing, right? Like, um, uh, for example, when, when I was, one of our first narrative experiences, mine and Laura's at Big mm. Soul, um, was a training program mm. that we, it was designed to take narrative filmmaking into the communities and make a movie with a, you know, a community. We've been up north, we've been, you know, to the, to the, to the urban centers, we've been to the prairies, we did all these different programs. And one of them ended up to be a really good short film and that was called Moccasin Flats which did later become three seasons which mm -hmm. you were on three seasons of a TV show the first indigenous all indigenous dramatic series but it started as this training program and it was like a 25 minute short film we ended up getting into Sundance the director was American but you know everyone was indigenous on, mm -hmm. on the show and uh, it got a lot of love and critical acclaim at Sundance. And uh, shortly after that, I was on a show called Bliss. Yeah. Which was, uh, as an actor, which was produced and directed by Adrienne Mitchell. Yeah. Who now you might know her from Coroner, because mm -hmm. that's her show. And, you know, she's done tons of stuff since then. Anyways. I knew her because uh, Talk 16, they were doing some radical stuff, like, way back. Mm -hmm. And her and her partner, Janice Lensman, they had a company um, where they did very radical, very feminist-focused programming. So Bliss was actually a female lens kind of erotic. Erotica. Yeah, erotica. And anyways, I was on, on an episode of that. They were It's an anthology series, so... You know, you spend a lot of time. It was like making a movie. Mm -hmm. And, like, I had the VHS of the Moccasin Flats short film. And at a break, at one point, like, days after shooting, I was like, you know, I have this <laughs> this movie, and it's like a short film, and it did really well at Sundance, and blah, 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 and whatever. Anyways, she's like, give it to me, give it to me, I'll, I'll take a look. So she watched it. And she's like, do you mind if I, if I send this to the network to, just to see or whatever? I, I think it happened like that. Like, it was so quick. And then, so Bliss was on Showcase. And then suddenly Laura and I had a meeting at Showcase <laughs> pitching the TV series version of Moccasin Flats. Yeah. And I forgot it was on Showcase. Like, I don't even know, <laughs> honestly. I'm sorry. That's not how it happened. <laughs> I was filming Bliss after Moccasin Flats was done. Oh, right. And they, told yes. her this was in the fall. Because it was on APTN before, first. No. I don't think it even was on APTN first. Maybe it was. But this was in the fall. It was in October. Okay. Before Sundance. And I said, we got into Sundance. Oh, okay. Here's the movie. Would you look at it? And, you know, we want to maybe make it into a TV series. She showed it to Showcase, and the next thing you knew, Laura and I were at Showcase pitching this TV series, yeah. and we, like, quickly, like, had an idea, we were pitching it, whatever, that was, like, our first real big network pitch, 
And it was so scary because you train for these things, right? At all the festivals and Banff and all these things. I've been training my whole life for this moment. Yeah. How to pitch, how to pitch a network executive. And here we are like pitching this show and we really didn't know what we were doing. And then, so this must have been, maybe it was November because it was not long after that we had pitched it to APTN and APTN was like, yes, we really like this idea and we want to make a TV series. Um, and then we were at Sundance. So Sundance is always in January. So it was in January. It felt like just very shortly after we met her and we got good feedback and whatever. And we, so we brought all the kids from the short film to, to Sundance and we rented this massive cottage and condo or whatever and we were doing the sentence, all of our screenings were sold out. It was so overwhelming. <laughs> and then we get a call from Showcase. I think there were cell phones at the time. Yeah, because I remember the weirdest thing that I took, she called me, the network executive from Showcase. I was walking down the main street of, at Sundance, and I sat down. You know, there, you know, there's that alley with that guy who sits on the bench. Yeah. So there's that, that, metal, guy. that <laughs> metal guy, and he's sitting on the bench, and I was, like, sitting beside him like this. And then... Polly Shore sat down beside me, <laughs> and I was like on the phone with Showcase. In between this metal guy, metal guy and Polly Shore. Shore, and like he's on this very annoying call, and I was like, "Ew, that's right, I'm out here. I'm on an important call." And I was like, "Yeah, uh huh, okay." She's like, "Can you get me your Bible?" And I was like, "Yep, got it. Okay, Bible, got it." <laughs> And I got off the phone and I called Laura and I was like, what is a Bible? Oh my God. I didn't even know what a Bible was. <laughs> I looked up, we asked people where the Sundance film was. We're like, what's a Bible? So we ended up not participating in the rest of the festival and wrote the Bible. I was like, yeah, we're going to, we'll, we'll grab it for you. It's, we don't have it with us right now. So we're at Sundance. Yeah. We're at Sundance <laughs> a few screenings, whatever. We'll grab, we'll, we'll flip that over to you right away. <laughs> and we wrote a whole season in three days. Wow. It was insane. And then we were shooting in June. Yeah. That's crazy. It was insane. Ah, oh, yeah. That's, oh, my God. I haven't told that story in a long time. That's, <laughs> that's a good story. Opportunity meets preparedness. Oh, you my gosh. Ready. It was, yeah. So it was literally like, you know, and I look at that and I'm like, how, how are we not further Right? Like, yeah. that was Rachel Fulford at the time was at Showcase. Yeah. Was so, and it was Laura Michael Titian, like, they were radical. And what yeah. they did was nobody else was doing it. No, it was really, really courageous. Very courageous. And, you know, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was an incredible time. Um, you know, and I just knew. I knew at that point, you know, and then things weren't really working out between in our partnership, me and Laura. Um, and I decided to branch off and just be more, you know, it was very hard for me to have to run a company mm -hmm. and just your whole life is the company. Mm -hmm. I had just gotten married and, you know, I, I wanted like a more, a little bit more relaxed life like we were doing 18 hour days at the office and everything was about the company i mean yeah it didn't really i love happen. like that you even thought that being in this industry yeah. can be you can't there's no relaxing in this industry so you know i continued to produce um and i've done you know i can say now that i have done i have created and produced everything from massive live broadcast events yeah. like the inspire awards for 12 years feature film doc series mm -hmm. like tons of doc series um drama series short films music videos lifestyle shows factual shows because you have to like mm -hmm. when you're when you're like in the margins, mm -hmm. you kind of have to be able to do anything at any time, mm -hmm. you know, and that includes all the other stuff in between. If you're, if you got to get a job at a restaurant, that you get a job at a mm -hmm. restaurant, if you, whatever. So, um, we're, we're in a pandemic currently. Yeah, we are. Which is part of the conversation. But what do you think? I mean, 
you've seen it with your own production right now, but what do you think is the future of film and television and what are like things are things are changing daily with our unions and with the new rules and how to roll out <clears throat> you know writing rooms are now being held you know via zoom um you know do you think do you i mean just even thinking you know it's it's going to be very expensive to make stuff in the foreseeable future. What do yeah. you think, what do you think about like independent film or, you know, people who don't have a big budget? Like, what do you think that's going to look like in the next few years? Well, I think it will be, I think the, uh, the divide between like the haves and the have nots in the industry will, will, definitely get get larger mm -hmm. the, the divide will grow. it's definitely exposing right? the huge disparity yeah of like you know the people who can afford to shoot right now are yeah. the big big conglomerate yeah network so um there's there's a lot of answers i have to that i've obviously been thinking about it a lot because i'm in the industry i have a production company i'm i'm an active you know creator of content um there's a few things that i know I know that storytellers will always tell stories mm -hmm. and they will find a way mm -hmm. and audiences will always need to consume stories. Mm -hmm. I think that that's changing like really quickly because, you know, I'm pretty sure that, that kids like to watch TikTok more than they like to watch long form mm -hmm. dramas, right? Hopefully that appetite changes as they grow up. But, you know, I think the way we watch, even pre COVID, the way we watch and what we watch and how we watch it, you know, on what platforms we watch it has, has totally changed. Mm -hmm. So I think that everybody was being forced to so-called pivot prior to COVID anyways, right. I think that it's a different, it's just, you have to catch up, you know, and get with the times. Um, but I think there's always going to be a way, like there's going to be the big, big budgets mm -hmm. who can, you know, own a whole, whole hotel or a studio mm -hmm. and everyone's in quarantine and everyone's safe. And there's that like the multi-million mm -hmm. dollar productions. And then I think what's going to happen is there's going to be, you know, the low budget, there's going to be no medium budgets because you can't do anything on a medium budget mm -hmm. and still, you know, adhere to the protocols, mm -hmm. safety protocols and insurance and all of that stuff. You just can't. Um, it's going to get lower, I think. And you're going to have to, you know, be way more resourceful mm -hmm. for way less money. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, like a show, you know, like my current drama series, that is probably like 300,000 an episode. You're just going to have make a lot less with that mm -hmm. because so much of that is going to go to preventative, preventative mm -hmm. and plan B's and contingencies and insurance and, you know, extra days for, you know, holding and extras and actors and food and everything's changing. So, um, everything's, everything's going to cost more. So the output I think for, for the lower budget is just going to be a lot. You're going to have to be a lot more innovative. You know, that said, uh, I also think that we just have to, if you want to tell stories, if you want to direct, if you want to write, then you still can just do it mm -hmm. because we're living in a time where, where you can get onto platforms that didn't exist, mm -hmm. you know, when I started. And people are making valuable, important content on those platforms. Has it changed the way you like have, has it changed the way you see future projects? Like, are there certain things that maybe you're considering, you know, approaching in a different way due to, you know, new regulations or new rules that would come like, yeah, I less mean, less cast or like different locations. Are there things that like 
is that now part that does that have to now be part of like absolutely moving forward with other projects that you have in development because i know you have another tv series that's yeah. being written so it's like an opportunity at this time also to say if this continues another two years what are things yeah well for example so i have a, a show with with cbc um it's not it's not my show but I am the executive producer and co-creator of the show with another production company. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very high level, high concept show that was in old, the old world going to be very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's already almost done its development phase of fully writing five of six one hour episodes. Um, so what would have been the end of development and the bit, you know, possible green light, just to go and make it. Mm -hmm. Now there's a whole other phase that has to be considered if it's going to be made, which mm -hmm. is go and rewrite all the scripts mm -hmm. to accommodate for all these rules and protocols that are in place. Right. So, you know, and what, what impact is that going to have on the show, on the story? Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, maybe it will be one of those super high level, you know, very high budget shows that, you know, you can do a lot more with because mm -hmm. of the kind of money you have. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that show is going to get made. Um, you know, I'm very comfortable working in the low budget world and I would like to, I would like to continue to work. Not that I exclusively want to work with low budgets. Mm -hmm. Like, man, I would love to be making an Amazon show. Right. Yeah. Um, but I would only love to be making an Amazon show if it was my own. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't just want to do it just to be on, on a show like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can tell you that everybody is feeling the same way. Like mm -hmm. I know directors and producers who work at the highest levels of the industry and who are, you know, just beginning mm -hmm. and there's no difference in the way they feel about the future. Yeah. It's uncertain for everybody. Mm -hmm. Which is sort of comforting. You no, know, it is sort of a an equalizer in some way, right? Yeah, and I and I think too with this, you know, this whole movement, you know, to elevate um, you know, people of color uh with all the protests happening and the the recognition and acknowledgement of that, it's a good time to take that time to shift and for everybody to look at their projects and say who are we writing who are we involving? absolutely so it's interesting that it kind of all culminated in the same yeah. hectic um really like unpacking of all these really like you were talking about the you know the um what do you call it the uh disparity between you know, big budget and then yeah. really low budget, um, to like kind of unpack all these things that have been happening on, in, in our industry for so long and to see like, what, how can we make this sustainable for everybody and inclusive Yeah, for everybody? Yeah. On so many different levels. I mean, I hope that's, I hope that's what people are thinking. You know, I know that there are people thinking that, um, I think it's probably going to be, in large part, like the new generation mm -hmm. of storytellers that are a little bit more aware of, you know, be maybe more accountable for the stories they're telling and how mm -hmm. those stories, you know, have the potential to shape narratives in our society. That's a huge responsibility. And I don't think many people realize like how, uh, what, what a responsibility that is. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're all out to, it's entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, the thing that I've I've heard my whole life. It's like, why do you care so much? It's entertainment. Like, you know, all of that, you know, just brushing off of, of the whole reason why I do this in the first place is to, you know, make an impact and make a difference and ultimately try to make the world a better place. Yeah. Right. That's, that's really what I'm trying to do. Um, we've talked about this a lot and I think we've also spoken to other indigenous filmmakers in the community but this idea that we don't have a luxury of just being a producer or an actor like me as an actor I don't get to just go to set and act you know yeah. if I'm you're always a teacher I'm, if you're... I'm 
if I'm playing an indigenous character, um, you know, I'm commenting on the wardrobe, I'm commenting on the set of my apartment, I'm commenting on, you know, uh, people are asking me about the script. Yeah, you're the you know, the consultant you know, so for it's everything. Like, that we have to have all of these other jobs on top of just the one job yeah. that we're hired and paid to do. Yeah, I've been on shows where I've had to like go into like my apartment or whatever and like just take down six or seven dream catchers and like change up things because it, it really is like we have to be the cultural consultants yeah. at the same time. Yeah. It's a whole other level of it's work. A, it's a whole other level. It's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting, you know. And uh, the other, the other part is that, you know, you be, you definitely become because there's there. A lot of indigenous people that I know, whether they're in the film industry or not, are the only indigenous person that many people around mm -hmm. them knows. Yeah. So they become the go-to, like. Yeah sometimes what we spend a lot of our time doing is consulting and like for free, right? Okay. Can you help me? Can you explain this? Can you come and talk to this person? Can you come and blah, blah, blah. And it, it's exhausting. Yeah. And nobody has time for that. And I started to realize like, Hmm, that's weird that people ask, ask a lot of, of us and don't, you know, and uh, what we hear a lot is it's mutually beneficial. Yeah like no no it's not no. like what i'm gonna you'll get exposure oh what i'm gonna get exposure exposure for you know people people who aren't gonna do anything for me in the future <laughs> like it's yeah so I'll, generally i think a lot um needs to change and we are evolving and it's a you know a process it's a constantly evolving process the way and, and all of the changes that are happening during this time that we are going to tell, learn how to tell stories in a different way and maybe be a little bit more inclusive when we do tell those stories and recognize that there is a responsibility, you know, just to, to our community, our society mm -hmm. of, you know, the stories we tell and, and how that shapes the, that community or the narrative inside that community. Um, you know, that would be a wonderful scenario if, if that was happening. Um, there's, there's a lot of shows that I really love and movies that I love so much. And, you know, I walk away thinking like, I love that, but I just still, am really upset that there wasn't one person of color in that movie. That's not mm -hmm. my reality. Yeah. Like why, why it's is not, it, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's weird. And, and I just, I do hope, you know, that's part of why I'm here and why you're here and, uh, the work that we're here to do. That's just, that's just it. Right. And I'll, I'm going to continue, you know, I was a part of an international project that was brought about by a, an amazing producer, um, Ingrid Benninger, uh, during COVID. And, and she just asked like nine filmmakers from around the world, she was, she has a place in Innisfil. So she was living in Innisfil during the whole time and still is. Um, I live in Barrie and then there's like people from other places in the world. And we each did a movie in isolation. I'm, I'm, I have an advantage because I have a, you know, a husband who shoots and edits and I have a son who is an actor member and who can act. And so I made a little movie and now it's a part of a bigger movie, but it literally, I mean, yes, it's a lot of effort. And especially on Ingrid's part, who's putting all this together, it's a huge effort, mm -hmm. but ultimately she, we're going to walk out of this with a feature film yeah. that will go to festivals yeah. and will tell the story of a very specific time in our life yeah. that we all experienced together. Yeah. And that's the power of storytelling, yeah. right? So the future of stories, like, you know, I'm helping the National Screen Institute um, design curriculum for the next year. And we are talking about you know, post COVID and structures and protocols and like how you're going to do it. But then there's the, you know, the elephant in the room. It's like, well, what are these stories going to look like? Mm -hmm. Is everyone wearing a mask? Is who's, you know, are we telling this story? I think that over the next couple of years, we're going to just be seeing our story. 
Yeah. People, our collective people working out what happened now yeah. within yeah. their their right? form. Their and I think form. that the storytellers are gonna have to do that. We can't just pretend it did like I would be very surprised if if movies were still coming out next year that didn't have people in masks. Yeah. Like just not even as a as a precaution. Just as, but like as a part reality. Of the, yeah. it's, it's a part of our reality. Yeah. That's interesting. So I think that society generally would be pretty I don't know. People would be be upset, I would think, that they, that those that this story isn't being reflected. And then they would know how it feels I to was be just gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say, wouldn't that be interesting? Like finally the feeling of like are you just gonna erase what happened? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna use that oh again. Oh my goodness, that's great. Yeah. All right, well, I mean, we really covered everything on here. I love what the little studio we created, and you're such a good host. Can I ask you a few questions? Sure. I think it was really cool that you made a movie in Barry. I did. Yeah. That was I had the best experience making it. <laughs> so you worked with Justin. Yeah. And uh, Justin Brain Dick, power. which is like, I never knew that they existed and they have a studio here and, you know, he's, he's a filmmaker that works, you know, always works and, and lives in Barrie. You know what? Like it was all, it was like all around, you know, we, we drove, we did a bit in Creemore and up in Rama, but I had a very inspiring experience because they've created a template for themselves there yeah where they have a really strong community of a, a crew and actors that are very loyal to them and they make great quality work yeah and they're just working and it's like a it was like seeing a family just like amazing like worker ants just like getting getting stuff done and it was one of one of my most favorite experiences and everybody that I worked with I just I just loved I just love the experience. I love the movie. It's so, so sweet. It's called Love Alaska. Amazing. Um, but also, you know, for, for me, I, I, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I love a good Hallmark movie and I'd never seen an indigenous person in one yeah. of those roles. Yeah. So for, for me to, you know, be able to have an opportunity like that with not having to be like an indigenous character. Yeah. It was just so fun to go and play. Yeah. And that's like, those are the times that I'm like, whoa. Yeah. I don't have to worry about like consulting anyone. Like we're yeah. just, I can be an actor. I can talk about like actor inten things. intention and, you know, the scene and the story arc and my character arc, like yeah. all the fun stuff. And that was really just, you know, it was so quick. I think it was three, maybe two or three weeks that we shot, but it was like just pure so joy. Fun. It was pure joy. So I'm just so looking forward to seeing you know, everything that they do in the future and just, just, I was really inspired by them. I mean, I, I, I was producing, I started producing some, some stuff before that time, but it definitely lit a fire under me saying like, this can, you know, I can do this. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. Filmmakers can do this. You know, when you get a good, a good group of people that you trust and that yeah. will show up, like you can accomplish anything. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think what, what was cool is that, you know, I moved to Barrie from Toronto, you know, being having a lot of success in this industry. And when I moved, everyone was just like, why would you move? Like, Toronto is where everything is at. And I just, you know, I didn't really believe that. And, and I really wanted to be, you know, here um, and, you know, meet, meet our mom halfway and she would come from Aurelia and we would be here, everything. So, um, when I met, when I saw you on set, you know, and obviously like you're an LA person. So this LA sister who like works in the Hollywood side, mm -hmm. ending up in Barry making a movie was just like, that I mean, was also if anybody really wants to hire me to work in Barry, I'd love to continue working in Barry. <laughs> Um, but that was just like a great reminder for me too, that like, I should never feel insecure that I can't do everything that I need to do from here. Totally. You know? And even, yeah. even just the idea of breaking down these boundaries, I mean, we'll get a little bit deeper now, but like, 
of what success is as a filmmaker, yeah. as a producer, as an actor, you know, if you can work in this industry and you can go to work and have joy and have purpose yeah. and have community, there's way too much pressure to be part of the Hollywood system or to be part of the like cool Canadian system. Yeah. Or, like there's so many, um, I don't want to say like, I don't want to say like lies, but there's so many mis misconceptions about what success is in this right. industry. And we've gone through it all. We've been part of big productions. We've been, you know, scrappy doing our own stuff with no budget, but it really is like, it is what you make it. Yeah. And, and like having an integrity and being able to be truthful to yourself and like, just continue on your journey is really at the end of the day, like takes you way further yeah. as a human being yeah. than, you know, being, being part of a toxic environment, being part of a toxic relationship, like it can be a tough industry. Yeah. So it's those things too. I mean, I think, which I think you're so great at on social media and, you know, as a personality, it's just like ripping down those stereotypes and those tropes of like what it means, what we think it means to be like a successful mother and a right. successful businesswoman and, you know, the true story about what that is. Yeah. So yeah. Keep doing it, man. Ditto. You do it. Ditto. Oh my God. I got a little comfortable there. I was just like, <laughs> You're like yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Double chin. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that's awesome. Great. I hope you enjoyed this episode. <laughs> we might do it again. Um, yes. Uh, support the Berry Film Festival and, uh, Yeah. Thank you for having us and thank you for watching. And uh, I guess if you'd like to follow us on social media for more exciting information, I'm at, at Jennifer Podemski. Underscore, at underscore Sarah Podemski, underscore. <laughs> That's a complicated one.